Today's lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about mostly the major events of the Age of Discovery, uh, I think mostly up to like the time of Christopher Columbus. So I'll kind of go up to like mostly just discuss, discussing the 15th century. And later I'll get into like the 16th century and later uh, in a part two lecture uh, coming up next Tuesday, uh, next week. So that's primarily uh, what I'm doing. Uh, hey, hey, Hope. Good morning. I hope you're doing great out there uh, and all that. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions, like I said, during this lecture, this live stream, if you have any, you know, questions or comments about something, let me know. And I can, we can, of course, share that together. Uh, and then, of course, later, if you want to just, you know, comment, question later, you know, on my YouTube channel about a lecture or whatever, you can do that also. Either one uh, is fine with me. So uh, anyway, uh, from the previous lecture, I think we had just kind of, we had, you know, wrapped up uh, the Reformation is one of the things uh, that we had done. Uh, we had just kind of finished up on that. Uh, and then I kind of was getting into, you know, just starting to kind of talk about that period that kind of comes in later, uh, which is the, they call it different names. I, mean, I think the common name they'll sometimes call it is the Age of Discovery, uh, the period of world exploration. Uh, it's called all kinds of names uh, that they dub it. So you'll see different names uh, being used for it. But most of the period of the you know, age of discovery mostly covers from the 15th century, and it goes up to like the 18th century. So a period of like three centuries or so, uh, when mostly like it's in Western Europe. A lot of the Europeans like Spain, Portugal, England, France, the Dutch, uh, get kind of involved in a lot of exploration. They had other ex explorations too. Like I think the Chinese did some exploration, the Pacific and Indian Ocean, but mostly it was the Europeans that really got the ball rolling uh, with trying to uh, explore the world um, at the time. Uh, and um, so, yeah, Age of Discovery, that's the common you know nickname that they'll use or just for short, <clears throat> world exploration. Uh, as well. And of course, you can see a lot of them were in search of like, I think the two things they were looking for mostly was land. And then obviously Columbus, you know, one of the things he was looking for was gold, you know, like, you know, riches uh, to get, get wealthy. Uh, like you'll see with the conquistadors um, in the future, we'll get to let them later as well. Now, um, Here's a map, of course, showing you of the world at the time, you know, like, you know, like what it looks like now, I guess you can see, minus uh, Antarctica, I guess it's not in that map. But prior to the age of discovery, there was not much known really about the world. Now, I think most people knew about like most of Europe. They knew about that. Uh, they knew about parts of Asia. Uh, and then they knew about parts of North Africa. So that's pretty much, you know, all that people knew uh, in the world. Uh, people didn't know much about like the bottom part of Africa, like central bottom part of Africa. Africa was often called the dark continent, you know, for years. So very few people knew about that. Uh, very few people knew about the Americas. Although if you know about, I think if you took my 1113 class, the Vikings, you know, had discovered, you know, part of North America, Eastern Canada, they think. And they had like a colony there called Vinland, uh, which may have been around circa about 1000 CE, about 1000 something years ago. Uh, however, they abandoned it. They didn't come back. And so that was like the, really the only occasion where like any kind of Europeans actually had discovered the Americas before, you know, the Europeans came back around the time of Columbus. So like another, you know, 500 years almost. Of course, the Native Americans are already there. Uh, they've been there, you know, over 10,000 years or more. Uh, but Europeans were kind of clueless, you know, about what was, you know, across the Atlantic uh, and so on. Now, I want to get into and I want to talk about, you know, what were some of the major influences that really led uh, to exploration, like the factors that really lead into it uh, more or less. Uh, there's a lot of influences. I've got like a list of you can see like. I don't know, up to like nine, I guess, that were probably a uh, major influence on exploration 
the first one I want to talk about uh, that was an influence on exploration <clears throat> was the Crusades. Uh, that happened in the high Middle Ages uh, between about the 11th and 13th centuries. You know about the Crusades. The Crusades were this kind of like a holy war or a series of military campaigns by the Catholic West, like in Western Europe, uh, to try to retake the Holy Land in like parts of the Middle East uh, from like Islam, uh, which had taken it over. And, um, and at first they kind of succeeded, as you know, but then, as you know, it failed later by the end of the high Middle Ages. Uh, but what happened was when the Crusaders went into the Middle East, they discovered that all these Middle Eastern people had all these trade goods that they, they got from Asia, Asian trade goods, because of like caravan routes that ran through it. And so uh, they, they, they wanted like, you know, spices. Uh, they wanted uh, like silk, gunpowder, uh, paper, tea, things like that uh, that came from the East that they didn't have in the West. Uh, and so that had a lot to do with why exploration happened later. So people wanted, you know, tea and uh, they say, I think they say spices was the big thing. Because, you know, back in the old days, they didn't have like refrigeration. Uh, you need spices and salt to put in your food, uh, especially the food was kind of bland or maybe the food was kind of going bad. They would put spices in it to kind of take away from it, uh, things like that. Uh, the Renaissance was another thing that they think influenced also exploration later. Uh, the Renaissance was this rebirth of um, culture, art, so on, uh, in Italy and Europe. Uh, and uh, it spawned a lot of new ideas, uh, new kinds of technology uh, came about uh, that influenced exploration later. Uh, printing press, probably a big thing, uh, you know, John Gutenberg, I mentioned, was definitely something that was pretty important because uh, it spread like a lot of new ideas, like new kinds of books real quickly uh, into different people's hands. Map making, like cartography, is something that the Italians kind of started doing, like in Italy. The Caravel, I'll talk about new kinds of ships uh, that enable them to sail long distances, uh, as an example. And so there's all kinds of things that kind of came out of the Renaissance uh, that influenced people of course, later. Oh, and like new books. Yeah, there was different kinds of books uh, that influenced people. Uh, there was uh, th the famous stories or travels of Marco Polo, which was a book that came out in the thir late 13th century, uh, which told the stories of um, the Venetian merchant Marco Polo, who traveled throughout Asia. Uh, and he eventually went to China, Imperial China, uh, and he was a minister of some type, like an envoy under the emperor of China, Kublai Khan. Uh, and so his travels um, influenced people later. Uh, I think when he came back to Italy, uh, someone wrote a book down about his travels. And a lot of different explorers kind of were influenced by it. I think Columbus was famous for, I think, being one of the first that read the travels of Marco Polo. And I think he even brought the book with him when he went on his expeditions. Uh, when he crossed the Atlantic and all that. So that's an important book, Travels of Marco Polo. Oh, I did want to mention, too, um, I have a different slides, too, I can show you later if you want to look at them later. That kind of goes in some of the factors that they're important. So, yeah, the Crusades, the Renaissance, printing press. I'll get to the Caravelle more uh, later, Travels of Marco Polo. You can see the route he took as he went eastward across the Silk Road to China. Oh, yeah, Ptolemy. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ptolemy. He was kind of a big influence um, on also exploration later. Claudius Ptolemy was this uh, geographer, astronomer. I think he was a mathematician that lived in uh, Egypt uh, around the 2nd century CE. This is under like the Roman Empire. And he wrote one of the first geographical works uh, describing, depicting like what the Roman Empire was, you know, geographically. And he actually developed the first world atlas, like a map of the world, which I guess depicted the Roman Empire at the time. And that's what you're looking at uh, in that picture, uh, the map, that map. That's the first map ever drawn of the, at least the known world at the time, which included, I guess, northern Africa, Europe, and part of Asia uh, in it. 
And Columbus was influenced by the map, uh, by the way, uh, to want to, I guess, explore uh, and so on. And, um, and of course, there's all kinds of ideas, you know, about the world. Like some people thought the world was flat, you know, if you know about that. Uh, but I think by the time of Columbus, people started to figure out that the world's more round. And uh, But I think at the time, they thought the world was much smaller. And so Columbus thought he could easily sail westward uh, to reach to Asia. Uh, but like I said, it was thousands and thousands of miles away, uh, which he didn't really know. Uh, there's another big thing that really, um, I think, caused the, um, it's kind of important uh, topic I did want to talk about, which I think is one of the major, the major influences on why exploration happened. That was that fifth one there, which is the fall of Constantinople. We've kind of put some asterisks on that one, but they consider that one to be probably the one that really caused the, the Western Europeans to really seek different trade routes. Uh, what happened was uh, Constantinople had been for a long time the capital of the Byzantine Empire, which is based in like Greece, Turkey area. Uh, and it was conquered by the Ottoman Empire. And so the Turks cut off a lot of the trade uh, between like the Silk Road uh, in Europe. They had total control over it. And so the Italians for a while were like the middlemen of the trade after like Marco Polo came back. Uh, and so they lost all that. They lost all that control of the trade. And so what the Europeans had to do, like in Spain, Portugal, and all those other countries, they started trying to search for these sea routes. They could take them to Asia, where all the spices are and all that. And so some people wanted to go westward, like Columbus. Portuguese tried to sail around Africa, uh, as an example. And so that had a lot to do with, you know, why exploration happened. I think that's the big one, you know, more than anything. Uh, you can see a few other things there uh, that um, were at influence. Hey, Kiara, good morning out there. Um, but, yeah, there's a few other things, too. You can see that one, number six. Yeah, number six. Um, the, yeah, the Europeans, yeah, that's nothing, too, they did. They spread Christianity. That was one. That's a big thing, uh, especially the, the Catholic-type states in Europe, like Spain, Portugal, Everywhere they went, they would try to convert people uh, to their faith. You know, people that are heathens or whatever, pagans, uh, they tried to convert them to, I guess, the truth, you know, <laughs> of, the, of the religion, of the Bible. And so, that, yeah, that's kind of part of it, like a side thing that's kind of part of it uh, that's also there that they don't talk about much. But that's why, like, most of Latin America is, like, Catholic because of the Spanish and Portuguese that, of course, come in there later. Also, new technologies. Yeah, that's, that's like I said, talking about something that came out of the whole, uh, you know, uh, Renaissance. You had all these new inventions that kind of enabled, you know, these explorers to go on vast distances uh, by sea. Uh, and uh, one of the big inventions that they talk about that's real important is the so-called caravel. Um, so I got, I'll show you a map, a picture of um, what a caravel looks like. I've got multiple pictures of caravels I can show you. Here's, of course, another slide there, right there. I'll get to maps in a second. But, yeah, the caravel uh, is a type of Portuguese vessel uh, that's very important. And uh, it's a type of um, merchant ship. It's not that large. I think the average caravel was something like 70 to 80 feet in length, uh, maybe a crew of 30, possibly, at the most very cramped quarters. And uh, the caravel was known to have like two or three masts on it with usually having what they call a latin rigged sail. Or also called a, um, some people call it a Latin, a Latin sail uh, is a common thing they use. Yeah, latin or Latin sail, which I think goes back to the time of the Greeks and Romans. And what it did was it enabled a ship to uh, tack in the wind, like tacking they called it sail windward, uh, where a ship would use a zigzag course uh, to sail upwind. Like if the wind's, you know, sailing into the ship, you can't just sail upwind because it'll push the ship back. So you got to go at an angle. Uh, as you can see on that map right there, they're tacking, um, you know, starboard tack versus a port tack. Uh, and so to get to your point of destination, 
Uh, so that's why a lot of times it would take a long time uh, for these ships to sail uh, from, you know, point A to point B because uh, you couldn't, you know, sail in a straight line. Now, if it's, you know, downwind, obviously you can. That's, that's of course, different about that. Uh, these ships were really slow. I think the average speed was like five, six knots, uh, which is not very fast. Uh, but a lot of them, of course, have a rudder. And, of course, you see their armor like cannon, rifle, and things like that, which made them very formidable. So that's something that, you know, technology-wise, that it's amazing how the Portuguese, you know, Spanish sailed a lot of these ships all over the world, even going around the world and uh, things like that. Uh, also, technology-wise, uh, some other things you see there uh, in that picture, uh, the um, there's like some inventions that are very important, like the Mariner's Astrolab is something they always talk about, uh, which is really important. They started using that uh, in the 15th century. I think the Portuguese were the first to develop it. I know Bartholomew Diaz was one of the first, I think, to start using it a lot. And uh, this enabled uh, sailors to um, sail ships, uh, from point A to point B based on the latitude of the earth. And uh, what they would do is they would use the angle of the sun to figure out the point of where your ship is at. Uh, and it also enabled you to tell like time, like what time it is of the day. And uh, the only thing it couldn't do is it couldn't tell you what longitude is. Uh, you won't be able to figure that out. I don't think they figure out longitude until the 18th century. Uh, and um, I think they developed the sextant you know about that, which replaced the Astrolab, uh, which is a little later. See the sun, use the stars, you know, to you know navigate uh, your ships and all of that. Uh, the compass, magnetic compass, of course, big invention too, uh, which they think that maybe Marco Polo may have brought that back uh, from China because the, the Chinese, they think, were the ones that invented the compass. So that enabled a ship to go in a specific direction, east, west, north, south. Uh, so that also made things a lot easier uh, as well. Uh, another thing that's important was cartography, uh, you know, map making. Uh, and uh, map making was something that was, they think, first developed, like these more modern maps uh, were developed by the Italians. The Italians developed these things called Portolan, or they call it Portal Portolani. Usually put an I on the end. Portolani charts, I think is what they called them, Portolan. And starting around the 14th century, the uh, Italians started mapping out where all the important ports were, like throughout Europe and Italy. Uh, and uh, so this map here, uh, if you can see that, uh, depicted uh, like the maps, like a map of like most of that one is probably a 15th century map maybe right before Columbus discovered the Americas, but it depicts mostly like parts of North Africa. Um, it depicts like Europe, most of Europe. And I think just briefly part of like Asia, maybe part of Southwestern Asia, you can see barely coming in on that map. But you can see like the hump of hump of West Africa. Uh, you can see like where Spain, France is. You can see Britain up there. See England, Scotland, Ireland. Uh, that blue area at the top is, I believe, supposed to be the Baltic Sea. Uh, Mediterranean Sea in the middle between Europe and Africa. You can kind of see the Nile River coming down to the that eastern part of it. And I guess it was like the Red Sea uh, right there next to it. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of like the early maps that they have uh, at the time uh, overall. And, um, <clears throat> but yeah, that, that, that one I told you about with, the fall of Constantinople, that's probably the big thing that really caused why they went eventually exploring via the sea. Here's some replicas, by the way, of caravels. Uh, that's the Nina and the Pinta replicas, which they've, I think, built multiple, one of those <clears throat> originally. And um, so those are the kind of sails you can see. That's a Latin, Latin rigged or Latin rigged sails, uh, which were on the back to sail windward. Uh, on the bottom, of course, here, um, where was it? It's right here. Uh, yeah, the, on the bottom also, oh, oh, you can see a few other things too. Uh, yeah, technology like gunpowder type weapons, cannon, guns, uh, those kind of things 
uh, were also a, another influence, you know, on why the Europeans won. They always talk about guns, steel, and germs. I think those those really gave uh, the Europeans an edge uh, over a lot of the native cultures, especially in the Americas. Of course, germs being the big one, the impact of disease uh, had a major impact on, you know, taking control, you know, of, of, of the new world. Uh, and so I think they end up wiping out a good majority of the Native American cultures, which enabled them to conquer a lot easier. Uh, Prince Henry the Navigator, I'll talk about him first a little, uh, in a second. Uh, he was a big influence on early exploration. And Christopher Columbus, of course, probably the biggest impact uh, early on on exploration, uh, especially in the, of course, New World. So, yeah, let me go ahead. Now, of course, I want to talk about first today, I want to get into like the Portuguese. The Portuguese were really the first uh, to really explore parts of the really old world, uh, which they would. But they would, they would start a lot of the European discoveries uh, in early modern times. Uh, and uh, Prince Henry, uh, a little bit about him, who he was, uh, he's considered to be not just the father of Portuguese exploration, they do seem to think he's the father of modern world exploration that they have later. He lived predominantly in the early to mid uh, 15th century. Uh, of course, they call him the navigator. Uh, he didn't really navigate much. He didn't really explore himself much, uh, more of a sponsor of it. But uh, the term navigator is a nickname that was uh, given to him later in the uh, 19th century. I think it was historians started calling him that. Uh, and so the name stuck. Uh, his real name was not that. It was actually, they called him Prince Henrik, I guess Prince Henry, uh, the Duke of Bizu. Uh, and he was actually the son of King John I of Portugal, who's the ruler. He wasn't really going to be king. I think he was like third in line of the throne. And so mostly during um, his life, what he did was he predominantly sponsored a lot of exploration of the Portuguese and started developing their maritime empire uh, in parts of Africa, in the Atlantic. And the Portuguese really wanted to get into the um, sub-Saharan uh, trade in Africa, uh, which had a bunch of caravans, I guess, running through there east to west uh, throughout Africa. Uh, so they, that, that was part of it. Uh, right there. Uh, you have to understand in Africa, uh, you know, they had a lot of, um, they sought things like gold. They found a lot of gold there. Uh, of course, salt is another thing, of course, uh, important. Ivory, some certain animals, elephants, etc., rhinos. And then also uh, African slaves. That's one thing uh, the Portuguese are kind of infamous for, you know. They think they're the ones that really kind of started the whole modern African slave trade, uh, which will kind of expand later into the Americas uh, and all that. And um, they also they also explore the Atlantic, not just like parts of like Africa, West Africa, North Africa, uh, but they went into like, they found like the Azores, which are kind of to the west of Spain, uh, which were a set of islands there. And Madeira, you heard of Madeira, like Madeira wine, uh, which is like kind of to the west of West Africa. They found that too. I think a bunch of islands that are there too as well. They still control. I think they're pretty much both are controlled by the Portuguese, of course, today. Uh, there's a story um, that's very famous about uh, the Portuguese. The Portuguese heard about this legend called, I don't even heard about the Presser John legend, but supposedly it was a legend that influenced a lot of the Portuguese to want to go into Africa and explore and uh, the Prester John legend was some kind of medieval story where uh, there was some kind of letter that was circulating in Europe, medieval Europe, about some kind of Christian king ruler that lived in, I think I want to say close to Asia, like the Orient. And he wanted some kind of help from the West. <clears throat> he was being overrun by barbarians or something that weren't Christian. Uh, and so they sought to kind of seek this guy out. Uh, maybe they could find him, trade with him, whatever. Um, and some thought he was in India. Some people thought he was in Ethiopia. <laughs> they weren't really sure like where he was. 
they're not even sure he's a real person. Uh, some people think he was maybe influenced by the Mongols. Like they think maybe Genghis Khan or Kublai Khan, one of those guys may have been, may have influenced him or whatever. Maybe Marco Polo. I don't know. Hard to say. Because Marco Polo was, you know, living in the 13th century, which is I think when the letter came out or something like that. Uh, so Presser John legend was another thing that kind of influenced them uh, to do that. I hope it's talking about viruses or something like that. Um, yeah, they've had some, of course, but some of those were in you know, like smallpox, uh, bubonic plague, uh, which, yeah, a lot of those came from different parts. I know like uh, bubonic plague, I think may have come from Asia, like China. It went westward, kind of like the coronavirus or COVID came out of China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about smallpox and all that, uh, which I think was a big one that killed a lot of people. Uh, I know in Europe, but yeah, yeah, a lot of these would come, some from Asia, some from Europe, and then spread westward when the Europeans came, uh, of course, later, uh, more or less. Um, now, there's stories that uh, Prince Henry set up some kind of navigation school, which was in the southern part of Portugal. They're not sure if that's true or not. Some people think it's apocryphia uh, about that. Uh, they do not know that Amerigo Vespucci had something like that at one point in Portugal. Uh that may have been where the navigator thing came from uh, because the Portuguese were one of the first to set up schools to educate people on how to sail ships like in modern times. Uh, now, after, by the time that uh, Prince Henry died, uh, by the 1460s, the Portuguese kept sailing downward, like, you know, down the west coast of Africa. And uh, they actually would discover what's called the Gulf of Guinea. I uh, hope you know about that. Just kind of on the bottom of the hump of West Africa. They found that. That's where your Gold Coast, Ivory Coast areas are uh, in Africa. And by the 1480s, they found like the Congo River region, which empties out close to where Angola is in Nambia uh, in southwestern Africa. So the Portuguese start moving down the coast there. Uh, I can show you a map here, which is, I think, um, not that one, but there was a map here I had uh, showing you depicting I don't know where it is. I thought I had a map. Oh, here it is right here, the map. But you can see the Portuguese start coming down the coast here. Guinea's right here. Then coming down to Angola. Then eventually they're going to come down to the tip of Africa where the Cape of Good Hope is. Uh, and um, there were several explorers that did that uh, that are kind of important uh, that you need to know about. They had Bartholomew Bar Diaz. Uh, is usually considered one of the first big explorers. <clears throat> That's important. He was a, a Portuguese explorer in the late 15th century that sailed um, down the, the west coast of Africa, you know, reaching down where Angola is, but he kept going uh, down to the tip of Africa and uh, eventually sailed in what is called Mazel Bay, uh, which is on the bottom of Africa, where South Africa is today, close to where Cape Town is and all that. And he also discovered that what they call the Cape of Good Hope, uh, which is what the Portuguese nicknamed it later. And uh, he had a famous ship called the Seo Cristoveo that he sailed in, uh, which means in uh, Portuguese, St. Christopher. Uh, it might have been one of the first famous sailing ships in modern times that would make discoveries. And uh, the reason why the Portuguese called the bottom of Africa part of it uh, Cape of Good Hope was because it was a good sign that they could then sail around Africa. They, they reached the bottom of it and they could then go up the east coast of it and then get to like India. So uh, 10 years later, what happened, Vasco da Gama, who's really considered to be the greatest Portuguese explorer, uh, but probably all of them, I think maybe a little better than Magellan, he would of course uh, have another expedition which would, I think left in 1497, I believe is the year, he sailed down the west coast of Africa. To, he reached the tip of it. He actually sailed with Diaz. Diaz kind of went along with him and showed him the route. I think Diaz didn't make it. He died like somewhere on the bottom of Africa. I knew that. Uh, and then after about 10 months of sailing, uh, the Portuguese were then able to sail. You can see, you can see the route uh, they took where they then sailed up to where India is, uh, close to the bottom of India uh, right there by 1498. So um, that's important. The Portuguese, you know, will then use this as a stepping stone 
uh, to control parts of Asia, uh, like a lot of the trade. And so the Portuguese empire starts expanding eastward, India, Indonesia, China, uh, even getting into Japan uh, and all that. Uh, and so uh, they'll even discover the Spice Islands, if you know about that, the so-called Maluka Islands. They're called Malukas uh, close to Indonesia. They're like a lot of spices come from pepper and so on, Net, nutmeg, cinnamon. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, Vasco da Gama was pretty important. And they had one more explorer I'll tell you too real briefly. Uh, they had Cabral, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, uh, was another Portuguese explorer who also was close with Vasco da Gama, kind of knew each other. Uh, and uh, he went on another expedition, which was uh, sailing to uh, what is um, India, like right behind Vasco da Gama when he left. And um, he actually discovered, you can see in that map, Brazil uh, in 1500, uh, which was you know claimed by the Portuguese, Portugal, uh, and so Brazil ended up being uh, in the hands of um, the Portuguese. You can see Cabral here discovers it, and then from there he goes on to, to India. In fact, Cabral was the first explorer to, believe it or not, um, sail to like three continents. He went, went from Europe to uh, South America to Africa to Asia and India. Amazing with that. So... So yeah, that's how the Portuguese end up up here. And that's why, you know, in Brazil, they speak mostly Portuguese, of course, because of that. Right, now the thing I want to get really into today that's kind of important uh, is we need to, of course, get into uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, he, of course, uh, is really the most influential. It's, of course, the last thing we'll really get into today, talk about uh, is what happens with Columbus and, of course, his, uh, you know, discoveries in Afterbath. Uh, of course, of the New World. Uh, Columbus is, you know, this controversial guy today, I know. They always talk about, uh, but as you know, he's an Italian, Italian explorer, uh, of course, who sailed for Spain, for the Spanish, uh, although I'll get to it in a second. They weren't really called Spain or the Spanish yet uh, at that time. And uh, Columbus was, of course, the, known for the uh, modern discoveries uh, of the Americas uh, in the New World by the Europeans, on uh, 1492, uh, as you know, the Europeans hadn't really discovered it, you know, in a while uh, since the Vikings left. Uh, so most people didn't know much about it. And um, as you know, uh, Columbus's main goal was not really to reach the Americas. His whole, you see the Asia or bust. He was trying to sail westward to reach Asia, uh, what they call the Indies. That's what they used to call Asia because of India. Uh, and um, Columbus had four voyages uh, total uh, that they would have. Uh, I think 1492 to 1504 uh, that he would have. It was predominantly the king, uh, the kingdom of Castile in Spain. It was the main state that backed Christopher Columbus's voyages, uh, which was, I told you in that little short video, Queen Isabel I, you know, the, one of the rulers of what would be Spain later, the Spanish Empire, was one of the main um, rulers that really backed the voyage because uh, they saw this as an opportunity to not just get land, but probably riches, you know, for Spain. Uh, she also was married. Her husband was the ruler of Aragon, the kingdom of Aragon, uh, Ferdinand II. Um, I don't know if he quite trusted Columbus, uh, but, um, but those two states, you know, they would combine uh, later to become what we call the Spains, what we call the Spanish states or Spanish empire. And uh, they were often called the Catholic monarchs. It was one of the nicknames that they called Isabella and Ferdinand. Now, like I said, Columbus uh, on this voyage, this, the first one we're going to talk about mostly, as I usually do, um, like I said, would try to attempt to sail westward. And he didn't just go to Spain, like the Spanish states there. Uh, he also... Uh, went to other countries. I think he, he went to the Portuguese, uh, the French, and they even wrote to the English uh, looking for some kind of sponsor uh, for his voyages. He thought going west would be shorter uh, to reach to India, uh, not realizing the Americas were in the way. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of uh, historians often call the first voyage of Columbus between 1492 to 93 
the enterprise of the Indies, because his main goal was, of course, uh, to uh, reach uh, the the Indies, the you know, Asia uh, overall. Got some other slides here uh, you can look at as well. Uh, of course, uh, if you know much about it, um, Columbus was given several ships, uh, which are, of course, very important. You can see there the Nina, uh, the Penta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, of course, you should call it La Nina, which means, I think, the little girl is what it means. Uh, the Penta, of course, which means uh, the painted. Like, it was like a painted ship, where, the, where the, hence the name came from. Uh, both the Nina and the Penta were caravels type ships, um, which were a little smaller. Uh, and then they had the Santa Maria, uh, which was what they call it, Carac. A Carac was like a little larger type merchant ship, which is similar to a caravel, except it had made more mass, uh, a little, little length, longer length, like 100 feet in length, rather than maybe 70, 80 foot in length. And um, Santa Maria, which meant, by the way, St. Mary, I think it was named after a church in Spain, uh, was actually the flagship of Columbus. Columbus actually called the Santa Maria, he called it La Capitana, which meant the captain's ship. Uh, so that was the ship he actually sailed on himself overall. 90 men went, were boys, kind of went, went, you know, with the first voyage. Actually, they had a hard time trying to find people to go on the first voyage of Columbus. Um I think a lot of people thought they weren't going to come back. You know, I think some people believe I didn't know much about the world at the time. Like, like very few people had sailed westward. Uh, and so a lot of people thought they'd soon die when they get, you know, killed and wiped out uh, the expedition. Uh, I guess some people thought the ship would fall off the world, fall off the world. You know, some people thought that the world was still flat, maybe things like that. Uh, they did have these two, uh, actually there were three men that went with Columbus uh, which was very famous. Have you heard of the Penzon brothers? The Penzon brothers uh, were real famous. Uh, they were involved uh, with the expedition. They sailed mostly the Nina and the Penta. Uh, and um, they always talk about the Penzon brothers being the ones that maybe actually found the New World uh, and, not, and not Columbus. Now, the expedition itself, the first expedition anyway, um, sailed mostly from like um, August uh, to about October 1492. They left Palos, Spain, uh, August 3rd. And they sailed kind of a southwesterly course, um, kind of uh, sailing uh, more or less um, instead of like westwardly. And uh, Columbus almost didn't make it. After about two and a half months, his crew almost mutinied against him. As they were kind of concerned like they weren't going to come back or they would get wiped out. Uh, and so uh, Columbus, Columbus reminded a lot of the crew uh, that whoever saw, saw land first would get uh, like a gold reward. Uh, and so apparently there was a lookout. I think it was like August 12th, 1492. I think at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, there was a, a sailor uh, by the name of... Um, I think his name was um, Rodrigo Triana. I think his name was, yeah, Rodrigo. Yeah, Triana, D. Triana, I think was the name was. He actually sighted land, uh, which I think was the Bahamas, uh, close to Florida. And um, I think when he went to go claim the reward, Columbus said he saw it first <laughs> and got the money instead. <laughs> that Columbus. Uh, but anyway... Um, so yeah, they find like the first islands there. And of course, in that video, you saw the first island that they supposedly come ashore to the, um, Spanish call it San Salvador, which I think there's different translations of it. Uh, but some translate as being a uh, Holy savior or something like that, I think is the translation. And, um, for years, it was also called Watling or Watling's Island because there was some kind of uh, English buccaneer uh, that used it as his headquarters in the Caribbean. I guess where he buried treasure or whatever. Uh, John Watling, I think, was his name. He was a buccaneer of some type, pirate. Uh, so they call it that, too, as, as well. And the Indians, 
like the Native American people that Columbus comes to meet there, of course, uh, are called the Tiana, Tiana, Tianu, yeah, Tianu people, I think so they say it, or something like that. Uh, and um, they called it Guanahani, was the nickname uh, that it was called. And um, so, yeah, it's the first instance where the uh, Spanish, you know, uh, or Europeans, you know, first beat indigenous Native American peoples. And so uh, if you know about it, that's one of the controversial things about, you know, Columbus's expeditions, you know, so-called Columbus Day, which I guess occurs in October every year. Uh, a lot of people don't like Columbus, you know, because they kind of see him as this villain and the guy that killed all the Native Americans uh, and all that. Uh, but, of course, you know, if it wouldn't have been him, it would have been some other guy that would have killed him, you know, if it would have come. Uh, but yeah, Columbus was kind of a cruel guy. You know, I think he was known for enslaving a lot of the like Native Americans uh, originally. A lot of it was because the Spanish were, you know, in search of gold, like wealth uh, and stuff like that. That was the reason for it. So uh, anyway, uh, this, that was the initial part of the expedition. They, they didn't end there. Like if you go... Uh, to the map of um, Columbus's first voyage, uh, which is right here. Uh, you can see how um, after he discovered the Bahamas, you can see he next went into Cuba and then also uh, into uh, what is Hispaniola. Uh, and um, yeah, they discovered that. Of course, Hispaniola is where Haiti and Dom the Dominican Republic is, uh, which is right there. And uh, I don't know if you can see that map there. It's kind of hard to see right there. But um, when what is like the northern coast of Haiti, uh, the Santa Maria shipwrecked, like off the coast, it was lost. Uh, and so he couldn't, you know, get all of his crew back, you know, back to Spain uh, and all of that. And so he built a settlement there, which was called La Navidad, which means like basically Christmas, what it was called. That became like the first kind of attempt at the Europeans trying to colonize uh, part of America. And so he took the actual part of the ship and built a fort out of it and left some men there. Um, and then from there, um, he went back to uh, what is um, Spain in 1493. Uh, by the way, when he came back on the second voyage, he went back to Hispaniola, see what happened to his men. They were all dead. They got They had been wiped out by the Native Americans, they killed them. Um, so, so yeah, the first settlement didn't work out. Uh, and it wouldn't be until really 1496 that the Spanish really, I guess, build the first real city uh, that they have in the New World. And that is uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, it's found, it's named after St. Dominic, um, Catholic saint. It was found in 1496 by uh, one of Columbus's brothers, uh, Bartholomew. Bartholomew Columbus. Uh, and so you know about Santo Domingo. It's the now the capital of the Dominican Republic, uh, you know, to the eastern side of Haiti there. And yeah, it is. Uh, that's one thing about Santo Domingo. It is considered to be the oldest European city founded in the Americas. So the oldest in any other city, of course, uh, today. Uh, like I said, there were four voyages of Columbus uh, that they had. Uh, yeah, he had three other ones that he that would follow up to like 1504. Uh, Columbus was primarily known for his explorations of the Caribbean Sea. I don't know if you know about the Caribbean. It was named after these uh, indigenous people called the Carib uh, that lived throughout that region, hence the name. I think they were cannibals or something like that, I've heard. Uh, and they'd eat people after they would capture them. Uh, and uh, so hence the name Caribbean but uh, Columbus is the one that pretty much discovered all the different islands uh, of the Caribbean. Like if you think about like Jamaica, Cayman Islands, um, Tr Trinidad, Tobago, uh, Grenada, uh, you name some island, Puerto Rico, uh, just about all the islands in the pretty much uh, the Car Caribbean uh, were discovered uh, by Columbus. He also went down the um, eastern coast of Central America, to, like exploring it. Uh, I think I want to say from, I want to say Nicaragua down to maybe close to Guatemala. Yeah, Guatemala. And then maybe I want to say, maybe gotten down to Costa Rica 
as well, possibly. But he went down that east coast of Central America. They say he also sailed into like a lot of the northern bays of like South America, where like Venezuela is and all that. So he, he was, he explored that area too. Uh, but Columbus never got into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is, you know, to the north of the Caribbean. So he didn't really find the mainland of like North America, but he did find part of, they think, maybe Central America and part of maybe the northern part of South America. So yeah, he did discover America. I mean, they, you know, that's like at least in modern times, uh, he did. He they pretty much got clean for that uh, overall. But Columbus thought that he was actually close to Asia. He didn't think he was in like a new continent or anything like that. Now, one of the big things that happens, of course, after uh, Columbus, you know, came back, you know, to Europe was the Europeans, uh, like the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, decided that, you know, after all these new discoveries that they had to figure out what to do with them. Uh, and so uh, there was a treaty signed uh, between both sides, uh, which was the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas that came next, uh, which was around 1494, uh, which involved, by the way, the Catholic Pope, Alexander VI. He got involved in it. He drew up this treaty between the, the two sides. Uh, and what it did was the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire divided up all these new claims from these discoveries. So everything from that, well, I guess originally that gold line, which they then, I think, moved over where that blue line is, like which goes through Greenland, down through South America, everything to the west of that, west of Greenland, uh, would go to the Spanish. And everything to the east of it would go to the Portuguese. And so the Spanish would end up with pretty much most of the New World although the Portuguese would end up with Brazil uh, because of Pedro Cabral. Um, and the Portuguese would end up with the old world uh, with Brazil. So they're kind of, you know, I guess, creating their own spheres of influence, like well, they're, where they'll colonize and trade uh, and all that later. A lot of that was done uh, because the Catholic Church was worried that the two states would start fighting a war over it. And I guess the the crown that the uh, the Pope was really worried about trying to convert everybody. Like he saw that as an opportunity to spread churches and convert people to Catholicism throughout the world, you know, et cetera. Uh, then there's one more thing I want, a few more things I want to talk about, uh, which is true. Uh, they have this thing called the Columbian exchange, uh, which was something that was big uh, that happened uh, afterwards as well. And uh, the Columbian exchange was this um, new modern term uh, that was coined by Alfred W. Gr Crosby, who wrote a book about it called The Columbian Exchange, which, by the way, a book you could have read if you wanted. It's in the book list. Uh, and basically what happened was between the Europe and what is um, like Europe and the old world, the old world and like the new world, everything got exchanged back and forth, whether it be plants, animals, ideas, technology, diseases, uh, and so on. And uh, you can see all the different things that, you know, went back and forth uh, between both sides. So from Europe, they brought over new kinds of plants, like, you know, citrus fruits. Uh, you've got, um, yeah, citrus fruits, grapes, bananas, sugarcane, honeybees, different kinds of livestock here, cattle, sheep, pigs, horses, all those kind of grains we grow today in, uh, in uh, the new world, uh, wheat, rice, barley, oats over here, peaches, pears, coffee, beans, turnips, olives, onions. And you can see all the disease you were talking about earlier. I think Hope was talking about it. Yeah, all oh, smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough, bubonic plague, of course, now COVID. <laughs> And then, of course, you got the uh, new world. Look at all things, of course, sweet potatoes, different kinds of peppers like red pepper, squash, pumpkins, turkeys, tobacco, pineapples, chocolate, which is cacao, uh, beans, different kinds of beans, vanilla, corn, tomatoes, uh, potatoes, peanuts. So, you know, think about it. Like 
if they wouldn't discover the new world, you wouldn't be able to have pizza with red sauce, right? You wouldn't have French fries at McDonald's. You wouldn't have peanuts in your M&Ms. You wouldn't have turkey for Thanksgiving or pumpkins for Halloween. <laughs> so just all those different things, you know. Uh, you wouldn't be smoking cigarettes, you know. I think they say marijuana came from the whole world <laughs> and all that. But, uh, yeah, tobacco, you know, and stuff. I think they were talking about that uh, high narcotic. I mean, in that little, you saw that little Monty Python skit. Uh, they were talking about the high. Uh, I think they were talking about cocaine is what they were talking about, which came from the New World also as well. So, yeah, uh, I think the only disease I can think of, they say it came from the New World, was I think syphilis. There's a theory that syphilis, like a type of um, STD, came from the New World. Like the Native American women gave that to the men. <laughs> you know, that's how that got to Europe, supposedly. But I don't know if that's true or not. Um, so, yeah, so you got all these different things that were, you know, brought back and forth. Uh, but, yeah, the diseases, that's the thing. Uh, that's the most devastating thing, more or less, uh, that occurred. Uh, and um, they say 90% of the indigenous population may have been wiped out. Uh, because of diseases, the fact that they couldn't really, you know, support that. Their immune systems weren't used to like smallpox and all these other measles and so on that came over. And so it wiped out the population uh, and all that. Uh, one more thing I didn't want to talk about. I think that's it for today. But I got one more thing I need to talk about, which is uh, how America got its name. I need to get into that, uh, which, of course, is very, of course, another thing about the Columbia Exchange, if you want to look at that um, as well. It's from a book in 1972 by Alfred W. Crosby. But yeah, Marco Vespucci, um, I need to talk a few minutes about him and that's it. Uh, Vespucci was, of course, the one that really, where we get the name America. Uh, Marco was this Italian explorer and cartographer that was also involved in expeditions with the Spanish and the Portuguese. This happened like around close to the early 1500s right after Columbus's voyages were kind of coming to an end. And what Americo discovered was that Columbus's voyages weren't Asia. That's what he figured out. He was the first really to figure this out, uh, that this was like a totally new world, which is what he called it uh, from the Latin term mundos nuvos. And so uh, curiously, he wrote a letter about his discoveries uh, in 1503, which became known as the mundos nuvos letter. And it was a sensation. Uh, throughout throughout Europe. Uh, and so people started calling the New World, they started calling it America or the Americas is the nickname they start calling it. So that's where we get the, the name United States of America from. Uh, it's from, of course, named after Americo, Amerigo. And uh, it came from his Latin name, although uh, they say that the actual origin of the name America came from a saint, like a Hungarian saint, Saint Americ, who lived in the Middle Ages, I want to say maybe 13th century or something like that, to spell with an E, but um, that's the origin of how we get the name America uh, today. So, yeah, Ves America Vespucci is pretty important. Uh, he's a figure, you know, uh, that really, um, really opened people's eyes, you know, about the world. He was kind of a map showing like some of his discoveries as he sailed around like close to South America and part of the Caribbean. Uh, and so they start realizing this is a whole, whole new continents uh, that are basically here. Uh, and so that, that really opens the age of discovery um, at that point. So uh, anyway, um, looks like my camera went out. Um, let me try to fix that real quick. I don't know what happened exactly, but the camera went out. But, um, but anyway, um, that's basically uh, like the early stages of like you know, the age of discovery with world exploration with the Europeans. And um, I'll get to it later. We're going to have Ferdinand Magellan come in. Uh, he'll, of course, um, create more discoveries. He'll, you know, explore the Pacific Ocean. You'll have that. Uh, and they'll figure out that the world is a lot larger than what it is. I'll talk about the first circumnavigation of the world. And then also I'm going to get into, and I'll get, I'll, I'll talk about like some of the other European explorers 
that go into the Americas uh, and other parts of the world. Because eventually what's going to happen is the Europeans are going to come back and they're going to start trying to conquer the Americas and, you know, colonize them. That's, that's the next thing coming in, of course, because I'm going to get into like the conquistadors and all that after we, we talk about exploration and all that. So that's pretty much it for uh, this lecture uh, for this week. I'll, like I said, I'll have a part two lecture on the age of discovery uh, coming up next Tuesday. Uh, and uh, so if anybody, like I said, has any questions about this lecture, uh, you know, let me know. Uh, I think we had like one question earlier we had. I don't think anybody else has any for now. Uh, but if you have any comments, questions, let me know, of course, about the lecture. If you have a question, of course, about my about the class, just let me know via email uh, and all that. But before I go, I did want to remind you about that Canvas quiz, uh, number one, on the Reformation. Uh, that, of course, is due uh, Tuesday next week. I'll send out reminders every day uh, about it. Uh, also, a few reminders before we go. Don't forget uh, as well, um, contract policies. You know, if you haven't turned that in, let me know about it. I'm still taking book report titles, like whatever book you want to do uh, for your paper. Uh, just email me about that. And if anybody, like I said, is uh, interested in the um, oral history project uh, for the class, uh, let me know as well. So y'all take care. I uh, hope you'll have a good weekend uh, coming up. Uh, and um, that's about it for this lecture. So have a good weekend.